Hello everybody and welcome back. My name is Cursive and welcome back to another video. Today we have a meta-analysis per se based on the $100 speed duel tournament that I just hosted. Uh, so, well, obviously the channel has been kind of bombarded with videos from the $100 speed duel tournament throughout the entire week with eight videos this week, all of them being matches of the top eight from the tournament. Now that's done, we have one last video that will be required for this tournament, and that's going to be doing a little breakdown. And because of this, you might see me look at my uh, screen over here a little bit as I do have the results chilling over there. I want to be able to basically show you guys these results. So anyway, let's go ahead and start off with the overall breakdown of the event. So there was uh, 25 people who competed by the time the uh, tournament did start, which is uh, it's honestly phenomenal for my very first tournament. But anyway, we do have a, a deck list breakdown right here for the decks that I am currently aware of. Please note that this was a tournament where you did not have to lock in your deck. Throughout the rounds of Swiss, we have the most played decks per person uh, listed here. So as you can see, the best deck in the format, Moth Warrior, is chilling here with a five uh, player overall representation. Then we have Pure Insects with three, Moth Control with two, and Pure Gravekeeper also chilling at two. Some of you might realize that Pure Gravekeeper was at three in the top eight if you are in my Discord. Uh, like I said, you don't have to lock in your deck until the top eight. But yeah, and then you have a few one offs like Dinosaur, Viral, Dragon Collar. Uh, Karyushin, Spellproof, etc. And then there's four decks that are unknown. I'm not sure uh, what these four individuals played mostly throughout the tournament. Uh, a lot of these I was taking note of while watching other people's matches uh, during the tournament. But there, I obviously couldn't catch everyone's match. So this is what I am currently aware of. And uh, overall, I think it's a, it's a fairly expected breakdown. Uh, you do see the Moth Gravekeeper is also chilling at only one for the representation, which you might have expected to be a little bit higher, maybe at least at two. But um, even so, it's not completely unheard of. And yeah, seeing Moth Warrior and Pure Insects here chilling at the top definitely makes sense. And uh, Moth Control coming out as well, or as I say, like to call his Moth Lockdown. But I also played a sort of Moth Control variant where you just play some good generic cards in a with a moth engine and it, it really does work um yeah and obviously pure gravekeeper showing up to show off that they are uh, a force to be reckoned with but regardless this is the general uh breakdown of the tournament itself and then um some of these people did switch their decks going into the top eight here so now you guys will see on one side of me the cute little pie chart here representing the top eight breakdown okay should be there so as you can see i made this a little bit more generic than the uh, overall breakdown of the tournament um as you can see we have it's top eight so we have three moth three gravekeeper one despair and one spellproof armor that made it to the top eight those of you, for those of you who are curious which of these decks were played throughout the rounds of swiss um, so the Moth decks were Moth Control or Moth Lockdown, which was played by Ice Eight through all the rounds of Swiss. A Pure Insect by Giant's Bane through all the rounds of Swiss. And Tetra, who I also believe played his deck through all the rounds of Swiss. Um, Spellproof, which was played through all the rounds of Swiss. And then two Gravekeeper decks, which were also played through all the rounds of Swiss, or at least the majority of the rounds. And then we have another Gravekeeper deck and Viral Despair, which actually weren't played by the pilots of these decks. Um, the, so the people that made it, obviously Avault playing Viral and uh, Lucent playing the Gravekeeper. Uh, Avault played a Moth Warrior deck through all of Swiss and Lucent played a pure insect deck through all of Swiss, but they both wanted to switch up when they got in the top eight. It's a little bit iffy as to if you should switch up in top eight. If you've already seen a lot of success in the deck throughout Swiss, unless you're like really feeling spicy and you normally want to switch it up. But both these two did get knocked out in the uh, immediate round, round one of the top eight, 
when they switch up their decks. So it kind of goes to show that you sort of should stick to what you did use throughout Swiss, but both of them obviously proving that they are uh, fantastic players in the Speed Duel format. So this overall is the breakdown of the top eight here. And now we're going to go ahead and start showing you guys some deck lists. I obviously, like I said, I made this more generic because I didn't want Moth broken up into three different decks. But anyway, yeah, so let's go ahead and grab you guys' deck lists here. Uh, if you guys are curious to view these over a little bit more without it actually being in this video format, you guys can over to my head over to my Discord links in the description down below. And yeah, you can find all the deck lists there. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. So yeah, first things first, let's go ahead and look at the two deck lists that were made for top eight and not used in previous rounds. So first off, you guys will be able to see Lucen's deck here being the Hidden Parasite uh, 27 card Moth deck. Um, the only Moth deck that did opt to run three copies of Oracle in the main deck and also a Gravekeeper Shaman in the side deck, which is uh, very interesting. You don't see much of that at all. We also see Gravekeeper Steel here as well, which isn't a bad card, but another thing that we didn't see much of. Um, also, as well, running the largest overall deck. Um, his match was obviously a very quick one. He just didn't draw very good throughout his uh, his match. If you guys do want to watch any of the matches, um, you can find them on my channel in the playlist. that should pop up in the cards here now. But, uh... But yeah, overall, it, uh, it honestly looks very, very similar to the other Gravekeeper lists. A minus an Ambusher add an extra Oracle, which, like I said, I think is very, very debatable here. But uh, yeah, we do see Curse being an absolute staple in the Gravekeeper deck, which is very, very interesting. Um, I don't think a lot of people seen that coming for Curse to be uh, such a good card, but that, that 500 burn actually means a lot, and a lot of the top 8 and a lot of the higher level matches was just uh, small monsters poking for damage. Just good generic monsters like Yomi, Maneater, uh, stuff like that. Uh, maybe small 800 attack insect monsters just poking. So uh, yeah, running curse, uh, really not a bad idea, especially with uh, such little life points in the speed duel format, obviously. But yeah, so that's Lucent's deck here, obviously. Like I said, made specifically for the top eight, and we do see the standard deck list here, the one that I posted up, which is nice to see. So next, obviously, we have the other deck list that was made specifically for the top eight. We have a Vault's Viral Despair deck list. Naturally, we have Viral Infection for the skill here. Nice to see Kaiba in the top eight. Nice to see, uh, not Weevil, honestly. But, um, yeah, I mean, Triple Despair is pretty standard, and so is the Double Vampire Lord and the Triple Cost in here. Um, more so opting for uh, Blast Sphere over Zombina, it seems. I think that could be a little bit questionable, but um, it's also not a bad pick still. Maybe siding the Spheres and maining the Zombinas could have been a bit better. But, like I said, not a bad play. And, obviously, uh, the nice Barrel Dragon tech, which I do think is a really solid card in the uh, Despair decklist, just tributing over double cost and having that ability to pop problematic things, or problematic things, sorry, like Moth, or uh, maybe you're in a Command Lock, or something like that. Um, yeah, and obviously some protection for his monsters as well, with Pyramid of Wonders, and naturally the very, very important uh, recursion in Haunted Shrine and uh, Book of Life. But um, yeah, and Book of Life actually uh, almost did something really, really big against Gravekeepers, banishing their Oracle, but sadly Jar was chained to put the Oracle back in deck. But um, yeah, and naturally he's running Jar as his deck does have the ability to stall a lot better than the majority of decks. Sadly, we do see him immediately get knocked out in the top eight here. Um, not exactly the standard uh, extra deck that I recommend either, but uh, I don't think it makes that much of a difference personally. And um, yeah, looking at a side, I think it's a it's a pretty pretty standard side deck here. You have some back row hate if you're playing against something with a lot of back row. You have um, your forceful for moth and your aerosol for moth, and then obviously blast for uh, enchanter or oracle. So yeah. So that takes care of the two not uh, used throughout the rounds of Swiss deck lists. Um, so let's go ahead and talk about the ones that were used throughout Swiss here. Um, before I get into one that I think is most interesting, let's go ahead and look at Giant's Bane's deck list. 
So, um, Giants Bane, obviously a very, very well known uh, competitor in the speed duel community. Um, he does fantastic in literally every single tournament. But we do see the uh, the pure insect build coming out here with the Danapon, Gokapon to go ahead and search out those parasites. The triple man eater, along with the skill, basically having quadruple man eater in the deck. I really don't think Cocoon needs that second skill to be so broken, but that second skill makes it absolutely absurd to play against. Um, yeah, just being able to shuffle back in that man eater and use it again, basically having triple man eater is absolutely insane. We see double parasite, double moth. Um, I do think I agree with that overall, as uh, I personally found that running a super large uh, parasite engine isn't 100% necessary, and especially in Giant Bane's case where you can search out that parasite so easily, um, running triple isn't a necessity and you just run double moth I guess in case you draw one, and if you do draw one you might be able to drop two. Um, we've seen Ladybug actually a lot in this top 8, just for these stall decks like Giant Bane deck, or like uh, I say stack, which we'll get to a little bit in a little bit, but um, yeah, a lot of people liking Ladybug to just uh, recoup those life points. Like I said, a lot of small pokes happening in the top eight here, so having Ladybug can really, really put your deck in a in a powerful position. And usually, the one with the who runs the Ladybug and gets the most out of it tends to just win, um, which is really why uh, it's really. It's another really good reason to run uh, Forceful here, to hit that Ladybug from the hand and not have to worry about that anymore. But uh, yeah, we all see Mask of Darkness for the complete stall package in the main deck. Uh, triple Floodgate, pretty standard. Uh, triple Michizor. Michizor seen a lot of play in this tournament as well. Uh, I think it's a fantastic card. I wasn't super, super big on it prior to, but uh, after seeing it in this tournament, especially in conjunction with Maneater, it's fantastic. And then obviously Forceful. And Double Jar of Avarice. Um, we've seen a few decks run Double Jar in this tournament. I thought about it. I opted against it. But uh, Double Jar actually showing that it's uh, it's definitely worth it by a lot of these uh, a lot of these players. But then we come to Giants Bane's side deck, which I personally really like to see here. Um, we see Triple Hyper Hammerhead, which is overall a very very fantastic generic card, being able to bounce monsters back to your opponent's hand if they are running. Uh, waking, like we see Giant Spain is here, uh, bouncing back those fusion monsters, or potentially bouncing back Moth, or anything like that. Um, yeah, just a fantastic card to see, very very good in basically every single matchup, and uh, the only strong beater besides Moth in his deck, so if he does need to go for some damage here, it's, uh, it's nice to have. Along with that, we do see triple copies of Waking the Dragons. And also no back row removal for Giant Bane either. I guess where he wants to focus much, like mainly on stall, he didn't see back row removal as a complete necessity for his deck. But uh, yeah, the definitely the huge counter to back row removal with the triple Waking the Dragons. I think we actually seen him pop Waking the Dragons three times in his match. Um, once in one game, and then I think once in game two, and then twice in game three, which is... Uh, Phenomenal every single time he summoned that Ryu Senshi, which is a fantastic card as it does negate spell effects that are uh, targeting it. So basically, Parasite's effects don't affect Ryu Senshi at all. Then, obviously, Arcana, another fantastic uh, card to negate Parasite or negate other generic traps, a target, as well as Lue's ultimate to potentially get in that OTK. No reason not to run it. And yeah, overall a fantastic deck, sadly he did get knocked out round one, but it was a, a fantastic match, and I feel like if he wasn't paired up with Tetra, he might have kept on going. But now we get to my favorite deck in the top eight. I really wish it went further, but we have Lean's uh, Spellproof Armor deck. Oh boy. So, uh, yeah, Spellproof Armor. It's a... Uh, it's amazing to see this deck in the top eight, and Liam played this through all of the rounds of Swiss with a five and one record with this deck. I think she only lost to Giants Bane in Swiss. And yeah, I mean, there's a lot of uh, cards that you don't necessarily see all the time in Spellproof. I mean, Michizor is a big one here, and uh, a lot of people even don't opt for really Windstorm, and same with Jar. 
But uh, I think my favorite card in her deck here is the, I think it's a Dark Factory of Mass Production, I think that's what it's called. Basically just recycle those Pendulum Machines and Giant Mech Soldiers because one of the biggest issues with Spellproof is that you have six normal monsters. Once you burn through those six normal monsters, you're done. You have no other resources and you basically auto lose at that point. And because you need these cards to advance your game state to win, whether you're going to use Order to Charge, to Tribute a Moth to get over Moth, say for example, or anything like that, these monsters come and go super quickly. So being able to uh, regenerate them with the Dark Factory and then have Jar to also regenerate them and also regenerate the Dark Factory, I think it's overall phenomenal. And yeah, we see him with a lot of success with this deck, and overall, I think the build is uh, probably the best spellproof build you're, you're going to find, at least right now. So if you're looking to play spellproof, here's the deck list. It's probably right here, maybe right here. I don't know where it is, but it's going to be somewhere. So yeah, really nice deck there. Then we also obviously have the side deck chillin' with uh, two warrior eliminations. I think the only deck we see running warrior elimination maybe just scared of that uh command knight lock i'm i'm not really sure 100 percent here i feel like warrior elimination is a questionable side especially at two uh maybe one you can get away with here but uh at two uh, i'm a little bit iffy on blast is a really nice card to have and dust tornado is fantastic and a second copy of Jar instead of running the Mask. Obviously, you don't really want to see Mask in this deck. Now, she could have ran Pharaoh's Treasure instead of Mask. She opted for two Jars instead, so, you know, you know. I guess not trying to necessarily infinitely stall, but just last long enough to be able to kill her opponent, which makes sense, honestly. One big thing to note is that she does main deck a copy of Aerosol, and I feel it's very fair. I think um, a lot of decks struggle heavily with Moth, and if you do have the Aerosol and you get over it, so you kind of just have to deal with those bad matchups where you don't run into Moth and you're main decking, main decking an Aerosol. Uh, it's good, it's fantastic when you run into Moth, but it sucks against every other matchup, but sadly, Moth is so prevalent that you almost have to run this in the lower tier decks. But uh, yeah, and we do see the standard deck list coming out here once again, bada bing bada boom. So now we do come into the top four deck lists of our tournament. Here we have the Moth Lockdown or Moth Control deck by Isate here. We see double Dark Red, uh, double uh, Moth, triple Parasite, triple Maneater, double Yomi, double Zombina, Hyper Hammerhead. We see all these generic monsters. We sadly see Ladybug. God, I hate that card. But um, yeah, and honestly, I think it's just... I think, it's, I think the Moth engine is just so powerful that running it with a bunch of other generic monsters works, and that's just it. You run four man-eaters again, because why the hell not? You have a, a large Parasite engine to very, very quickly see that Parasite Paranoid. You also have um, a decent bit of a... It seems like actually opting not to run... Um, the forceful checkpoint, instead just relying on Dark Red Enchanter to remove those cards from your opponent's hand. And I think that's the big thing. I think Dark Red Enchanter is overall phenomenal, especially if you do have a face-up uh, Maneater, for example, because maybe you flipped it uh, on your own because your opponent wasn't attacking into it. Then just being able to tribute off that low attack monster for the Enchanter, Maneater's already done its thing, and Enchanter gets to rip a card from your opponent's hand as well. And you don't have to worry about it only being a monster. You can rip any card. I think Enchanter is fantastic. And um, I'm surprised we'd actually see more decks run it. I feel like it's kind of one of those like hidden techs that a lot of people don't know is so good. But it's truly phenomenal. So yeah, and obviously the Hyper Hammerhead showing up again. And a couple of Gear Fiends in the side deck. Uh, I guess for that Moth matchup. As well as a Night Beam. We do see Double, double Dust Tornado in the main deck. And one in the side. Um... Yeah, just uh, in case you need more back removal. And we actually don't see Isate even running a extra deck at all. Honestly, if you can't go into your extra deck, you still just run one, just so people might think you're running Waking, even if you're not. Uh, so yeah, it's recommended that you run an extra deck, even if you don't use one. Uh, I'll obviously double blast, fantastic. We've seen a lot of great keepers here, and yeah. 
Next we have our third place deck here from Bylot, another pure Gravekeeper deck as... I'm actually going to put Lucens and Bylot's deck right up next to each other and I just want to show you guys just how similar these two decks are. Um, the monster lineup is um, almost identical besides Ambusher versus Oracle. And yeah, I mean, we're just seeing this this Hidden Parasite Gravekeeper deck truly, truly work. And I didn't put Gravekeepers on my tier list video because, in my opinion, I thought, why even mention pure Gravekeepers when uh, Gravekeeper Moth is just so much better? Apparently I was wrong. Apparently pure Gravekeepers is potentially better than Gravekeeper Moth. Um, I could be incorrect, but that's what the results are showing. But regardless here, um, Wonder Wand actually put in so much work in these decks. Whether you're going Curse, Wonder Wand, Pick Up 2, or you're going Recruiter, Wonder Wand, Pick Up 2, Search. Yeah, we see Wonder Wand was putting in the finest of work. And uh, another fantastic thing about Hidden Parasite is that you get to main deck the Aerosol. You don't have to worry about using it only to pop um, your opponent's Moth, but you can pop their entire field with this thing. Yeah, fantastic to see. Obviously, triple right, uh, double dust, and um, you got the Jar of Avarice there for that stall matchup. As you can see, stall is still very prevalent, and if you're running any deck, you need to at least side the Jar, if not main the Jar. I think maining it is honestly required, but if you don't feel like you want to main that Jar, maybe you're not running a deck that should main the Jar. Most decks need to at least side deck the Jar of Avarice here for the stall matchup, as you can see based on these top 8 decks here. But no, yeah. I mean, we've seen Violet's deck have a lot of success. He went 6 and 0 oh in Swiss, and the only match he lost was against Freeze in the top 4. So, yeah, overall, a very fantastic deck. We obviously see um, one of my favorite cards, the, uh, the Ready for Intercepting. Fantastic for. Moth and Fantastic in a Gravekeeper deck. They target one of your monsters, you flip it face down, and that Moth gets blown up. Not only do you destroy the uh, the Parasite, but you also get to take a defensive approach with your Gravekeeper monsters, and yeah, you just... I think it's just such a fantastic card. I, I like to see it in every single deck that runs Warriors or Spellcasters. But regardless, there's Violet. Now we get to go into the big boys. We have our second place deck here from Tetra, another Cocoon Moth deck here, chilling with the big boy Parasite package, big boy Moth package here. We obviously have four Maneaters again. And we're running a Moth Warrior deck, what's known to be the best deck in the format. So it is nice to see at least one of these in the top 8 cut. Obviously, Triple Gear Fiend, Triple Command Knight, the best warriors in the game currently. We have a lot of back row hate here. We have a Night Beam, Triple Dust Tornado, even another Night Beam in the side. And just some good defensive traps too in Triple Windstorm and Triple Forceful. So yeah, overall, uh, just I think a fairly standard deck list from Tetra here, but uh, still just proving itself to really, really work extremely well. We also see uh, some very, like a very, very spicy side here with the Dark Red Enchanter. Like I said, I feel like it's a tech that a lot of people don't realize it's, it works so well. And we also see the Element Saurus coming down. So I plan on having a video on Element Saurus very soon. But basically, the big thing about Element Saurus is that it can't actually negate uh, your opponent's Maneater without there actually being another earth on field and along with that if you do look at the types in tetra's deck we have earth and fire which are the two types that buff the element source so overall it's a fantastic card to just to run in tetra's deck more than any other deck in fact i think if you're running moth uh moth warrior or a pure warrior build i think you need to run element source at least in the side because it works just so well with this deck like I said, we see Night Beam, and we see the Jar of Avarice here for the uh, stall matchup, potentially. And, well, we see a, a, a different extra deck than my standard, but honestly, he's not even running away into the extra deck, and like I said, 
the extra deck isn't a huge deal. But it's nice to see that he's actually running it, even if he can't go into it. So yeah. And here finally we see the first place deck list in the tournament from Freeze Fleet with another Pure Gravekeeper uh, Hidden Parasite deck. I'm honestly so sick of seeing Pure Gravekeepers. Like, I thought I was sick of Moth, but I've seen so much Pure Gravekeepers from doing these top 8 videos that it's uh, overall insane. But, um, Double Oracle. We see a very standard monster lineup, just not opting for the Sphere Karibos like the other two were. But instead we actually see Triple Ready for Intercepting in the main deck, which I feel is a better card to opt for in the main deck over Sphere Karibo. Obviously you're going to see a lot of uh, moths when you go into top 8. You're going to see uh, just, and even if you're not facing off against moth, uh, having the ready for intercepting either to hit your opponent's monsters, because obviously you've seen a lot of Gravekeepers in the top 8 as well, or even just hitting uh, your own monster to take that defensive approach with the ready for intercepting. It's just a really good card. I think opting for it over Sphere Creepo is very, very fair. Obviously, another good generic card. Windstorm and Double Dust and the main deck Jar once again. Really, Jar of Avarice is so necessary in the current format that I really don't think you can run your deck without running Jar. But uh, yeah, overall, besides that, it's a pretty, pretty standard Gravekeeper deck here. And the side, uh, he does run the third Oracle. I think it's fair to side deck that card. And we see Triple Mask of the Accursed. I would be curious to ask Freeze Quee if he does regret running Triple Mask of the Accursed in the side deck, as we didn't see it in a single one of his top 8 matches, but it was there in case he needed it. I don't feel like it's a big necessity in this deck, but you know, if you want it, it's there. We obviously see some more back right in that other Dust Tornado, and we see a very interesting side deck, opting for double copy of, or sorry, extra deck, opting for double copy of Alligator Sword Dragon. Not that he can go into it, so it really doesn't matter, but yeah, there's our first place deck pro or deck list from uh, Freeze Queen. So anyway, just wanted to do a quick breakdown of the tournament as a whole in the top eight. Obviously, I will go ahead, uh, I will just quickly bring up the uh, pie chart somewhere once again, and I'll bring it up on my screen for myself. So this is the deck list, the deck types, the monsters that we did see in the top eight cut here. And uh, yeah, a lot of these decks were already proven to be solidified as the best decks in the format. So it's not really surprising that we do see them. And yeah, overall, I'm just really surprised to see uh, Pure Gravekeepers do so well in this form, in this format and in this tournament. So if you're looking for something that isn't Moth, Pure Gravekeepers is a fantastic go-to. Or try Lean Spellproof deck. Or even try a Vault's uh, Viral deck. But regardless, that's going to be a wrap, guys. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you did enjoy this video and the rest of the top 8 matches, please consider hitting the like button and subscribing. But uh, yeah, it's going to be a wrap, guys.